right, so for the video, I just want to say once again, welcome to Calvary Chapel Comity. And I can tell you, uh, being away for a, a little over a month, my wife and I were glad to be home. And it's so nice to see your faces and just to catch up, you know. And, and so uh, back in the United States, it's summertime, it's hot and humid. And uh, that was fun for about five seconds. And then, but you got to breathe, right? So it's nice to be home, cooler temperatures, uh, but especially just... You know, we have family both sides now. Yeah, and when you live a life, you know, surrender to the Lord wherever you go, you're leaving people behind that you love. And uh, so so there's this balance of you love where you are, especially where you're called to be. You know, there's no better place. And yet when you're away from loved ones, you know, then there's that pain. But the good news is when we're in Christ, we realize that this world's no longer our home, really. We're just passing through. And we're looking forward to a city that has true foundations built on Jesus himself. And so as we now gather in his name this morning, you know, we, we, can, just, we, we can just rest in Jesus because that's who he is for us. He's our rest and he's our peace and he's our joy, even, uh, even though we struggle sometimes. And, you know, uh, that, that's something that we need not be surprised about. The Lord promises in his words that it's going to be a struggle. You know, it's a narrow gate and a difficult path as we follow the Jesus, but it's so worthwhile, amen? amen? And and so it's fun to gather with family like this, and we have that in common, that we're following Jesus, you know, and, and we, we might be in different uh, situations in our walk with the Lord, but we're in it together. And, and this is so much about unity and what the Lord's heart is for his people, his bride. And so we're in this uh, book of Hosea, by the way, if you need a Bible, uh, raise your hand and we'll get a Bible in your hand so you can trek along with us. We're in Hosea. It's in the Old Testament. So what I generally do is I just start praying and I start flipping. Lord, help me find Hosea. Right? <laughs> and uh, so I had a marathon of teaching. I listened to Ryan's three messages back to back to back. I was binging on good Bible teaching. And man, what a blessing uh, Ryan is in his teaching. Oh, man, aren't we blessed to have him? You know, to uh, be surrendered to the Lord as a, a young man, as surrendered uh, as a young family. You know, they literally have little kids. But um, Ryan is such a blessing to me personally, but to us as a family here on this corner. But, uh, you know, so I listen to Ryan. I listen to a couple other good teachers, you know, trying to catch up to where we are. And what I saw was kind of a theme verse from Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to read it. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, that's all of us. We know clearly from the Bible that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we see also in Scripture that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one good. In other words, there's no one deserving uh, on their own merit in their flesh to even be able to stand before a perfect God. And yet God in his love for his creation that is so broken because of sin has decided to do a perfect thing, to send his one and only son down to the earth and to put on flesh and to walk this earth and be tempted in every way yet without sin. Uh, and so he loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. You know, going back to basics, John three sixteen. you know, that's, that's the gospel. And the gospel is... For the whole world, but it's, you know, you can think of it this way, maybe especially for those of us who are desiring to follow him, we need to re be reminded the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is. And part of the good news is that extreme bad news of who I was before him in my life. I was in a pit of sin and hopeless and loveless, uh, unlovable. And that's when the Lord reached down and picked me up. Amen. That's all of us. So when we... When we're in books like Hosea, it's a nice reminder. You know, remember Jesus said of himself that all of the prophets, all of the law, all of the Psalms are about him. And so I love to come to a church where Jesus is the center. And when we open up, up any book of the Bible, you know, if we're not, okay, connecting with, oh, this is Jesus here. I see Jesus all over. Then we're kind of missing the point, huh? And then it becomes boring and it's like, eh, I could have stayed home in bed. You know, it was a chilly morning. There was rain last night. <laughs> Man, stay in those covers. But, you know, it's so worthwhile to gather and to be in the Word and to help each other. We edify each other and we can come along beside each other and, 
you know, this picture of, a, you know, just an arm around someone's shoulders and saying, hey, bro, I'm here with you. And, you know, I'm being dragged through it, or I have been, or I, I know I'm going to be. You know, there's a saying that if you're not struggling right now as a Christ follower, you can cheer up because it's right around the corner. <laughs> you know, we can anticipate that. And not that that even should be a downer. Uh, it's just a fact. But, but also the fact is Jesus is always there and he will never leave us as orphans. He's given us his word and his Holy Spirit. And we can walk in a powerful way because of Jesus and who he is living in us. And now we're the temple of God and we're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price, the price of Jesus' blood on the cross. You know, and, and our number one enemy was death until Jesus came to this earth and he took on death once for all in the sense that all of the things that cause death, which is sin, he took upon himself and he paid the penalty and we've been redeemed. And now those of us who, you know, uh, this idea of repent and trust Jesus, repent and trust Jesus. Now that's my walk. Uh, I'm continually repenting. You know, of when, when you come to Christ the first time, you repent. That, that's that 180, that turning. But then it's a continual thing because, see, we still deal with this struggle with the spirit and the flesh we read about in Galatians. And, and so now I have 1 John 1, 9 where if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just. It's always he. It's Jesus. He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's that's like my daily, even moment to moment verse. I'm living in that. Because see, uh, we see in scripture that we uh, should take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. To me, that's that's like the, the new or maybe the last frontier. You know, I, I might be able to, okay, I, I can live hourly doing good things. I can fool a lot of people and, and the way I say things might change. But see, it's always a heart condition, and that's what the Lord is happy to work on. And so he proves his love through even conviction of the Holy Spirit after he's written his law in our hearts now. And if I, if I uh, swerve off the path that he's given me personally and specially and uniquely, then the Holy Spirit's tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Hey, hey, Kirk, you don't need to do that anymore. Get back on my path. Follow me. You know, uh, in the special way that I'm calling you. And that's going to be individual. So the church, made up of Jews and Gentiles who have repented and put their trust in Jesus, is now this new thing, this organism that's alive and powerful. It's spiritual. Uh, and it's worldwide of many colors, shapes, sizes, languages. Uh, the church is unique in that it's, um, it's personal, each person, each member, and yet it's big as each member is now weaved together and built upon each other and together. And so now we see even in Ephesians, we're the building of God. We see in Ephesians, we're the bride of Jesus, you know, uh, all these things. So Hosea reminds me of all those things. And so imagine if you've been with us, you know, hearing Ryan's teaching, uh, this man Hosea, and remember, he's just a man. Yeah, he's a prophet, but you know, we, we almost cringe like, well, he's told to marry, Gomer, who is a prostitute, you know, that, and so, so our minds might tend to even judge or uh, think badly towards Gomer, but let's be reminded that even Hosea, a prophet, is a man, and all of scripture says that everyone has sinned and falls short of the glory of God, so he, he's, he's nothing special except for that he is surrendered in obedience to the faith of who God is. And how God has revealed himself to him personally. And so, so he was called to do some strange things, just like all the other prophets. You know, sometimes uh, you might, like in Sunday school as a kid, think, man, I wish I would have been a prophet. And then you read about their lives, and it's like, oh, no, please, Lord, don't make me one of them. <laughs> and yet, uh, uh, I love how Ryan explained, you know, being a prophet today is really foretelling the word of God. And we're going to do that specifically and specially gifted. Each person has at least one spiritual gift. We know from 1 John 4.10 uh, that we walk in this gifting and now we're an ambassador of Christ passing through this world and as we do, anyone that the Lord puts in our path, we can, we can now be uh, a prophet in a sense that I'm forth telling things about Jesus and I'm gonna do that supernaturally natural. I'm just gonna be a witness of Christ in the way that the Lord's made me. So. He's made me, even my personality, as quirky as I am and weird and, and strange, 
yet he can still use me because he made me. And, and as we're surrendered to the Lord, then we all fit into this bigger picture of it's all Jesus. And he's the center of everything that we can be about, the most important things. So, so Hosea, uh, you know, uh, Ryan gave us, gave us all this historical background through the books of Kings and, uh, and the, his contemporary about Isaiah. So Hosea is the prophet to the northern ten tribes. And about the same time, Isaiah is the prophet of the two southern tribes. And they have a very similar message. But it's, it's mainly proof that, the, hey, Israel, God loves you and you're going the wrong way, come back to him, repent, make that 180, come back to his love, come back into the realm of, of how you can be used by him as a people, as Israel. Um, and so we can consider that during Hosea's time, because we have these king's names given, and we do the research, we check the history, this was a time of prosperity. And as I was you know, preparing to teach this morning, I realized that really some of the, the, the toughest tests in my life was when I was prospering, especially the tests that I failed. You know, when, when we humans were doing well, sometimes, man, it's like we, we can just kind of slowly or sometimes fast, but we, we kind of move away from things of the Lord and we move into our own kingdom, you know, and uh, whether we know it or not, it's, it can be uh, just small steps at a time and, and we can wake up like I did you know far from the Lord and how did I get here and I see that oh I've been in this season of prosperity and I'm doing things my own way and, and we must be very careful so whether we have little or have a lot Jesus is always the king of kings and the Lord of lords he is the master he's the captain you know the old bumper st sticker that would say that uh Jesus is my co-pilot is, is terrible. You know, we need to move out of the seat of the pilot seat and let the Lord, you know, be the commander and the pilot and the captain of our vessel as we're moving about. So let's look at Hosea. Uh, I did want to mention, you know, uh, so Hosea has three children. And the first one, uh, the, the name translates as scatter, and we're going to see that that's going to be the future of the northern ten tribes. They're going to be scattered uh, and taken captive into Assyria. Uh, and then the second one was no mercy, the first daughter. And then the third one uh, was not my people. And we're going to see that play out. Now, so chapters one through three is really, in a way, um, what Bible teachers would say, a s similitude. And so the Lord is using the life of Hosea, a prophet, to experience and to show the heart of God. The heart of God is broken at this point because his people have moved away from him. And their prosperity, they've turned their back on him and they've turned to idols. And so uh, throughout scripture in the Old Testament, when we talk about um, prophets, we hear often that uh, they become a harlot. Uh, the old King James calls it whoredom, and, and they've gone to now uh, worshiping false idols, idols made by hands, by wood and stone and whatever. And uh, remember in history, after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided, ten to the north, two tribes in the south, and, and the northern tribes uh, were uh, led down the wrong path by their leadership saying, hey, we'll just build our own uh, places of worship. And there was places like Bethel, house of God. Uh, but we're going to see in today's passage that Bethel turns into Beth Aven. So the title of the message, if there was one, from God, uh, the, or from the house of God to the house of wickedness. And we're going to see that play out. So let's look at Hosea chapter 4. There's 19 verses. I see it broken down into to two easy kind of bites, but let's look at it in totality right now. Verse one, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore, the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste with the beast of the field, 
and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea, will be taken away. Verse 4. Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Verse 7. The more they increase, the more they sin against me. I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. Verse 11, harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills, under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters commit harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Beth Avon, nor swear an oath, saying, As the Lord lives. For Israel is stubborn, like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in open country. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I ask now by your spirit that you would open our eyes and our hearts to, to uh, see what you're revealing to us and to see you more clearly, Lord, as you speak in your word in Jesus' name. And so two parts. Um, the first part, you might say, is God's charge against Israel. So Israel has turned their back on the creator God, the God of the Bible. Now remember, uh, all of this, if you look at history, uh, you know, Adam and Eve and so on and so on and so on, you get to a man named Abram who becomes Abraham and he becomes the father of the nation of Israel. And there were uh, uh, eventually... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then 12 sons that, that make 12 tribes, and so on and so forth. But um, as time goes on, and this is in Hosea's time, it's something like 650 years after uh, Israel has entered the promised land. So there's been a long time now they've been in the land. But uh, just like the Lord said in Genesis, remember uh, life leading up to the worldwide flood of Noah? You know, the, Lord, the land was filled with violence and, and the, the thoughts of man was uh, continually evil. And then there's this flood. And so it's only the family of Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives, uh, they make it through. And then the Lord says that uh, even though the heart of man is continually evil, I will not destroy the world again uh, with a worldwide flood. But, but we hear this point. That we humans on our own are going to lean toward evil, whether we know it or not, whether we admit it or not. That's just the way it is. As soon as sin entered the, the earth with Adam and Eve, now we all have this DNA with us of sin. And so you might call it a sin nature. So even though we're in Christ, as the Holy Spirit does the work, we still have this struggle. And we're going to have that until we're face to face with the Lord with a new body. And we're going to be uh, in a situation where sin is no longer present. See, right now, sin is still in the world, and we're in the world. I kind of compare it to Lot. Remember Lot? He, he chose to live down by Sodom and Gomorrah, and it turns out then 
He's in their uh, leadership. And it says that he, his righteous soul was vexed. You know, and that's kind of us now living in this world. Uh, when I was back in the United States, something that, uh, um, that I don't do here is uh, there, there was TV on almost every place I went and the news was on and, you know, seven years later, it's still bad, bad news. You know, so I, I, could, I could say, oh, okay, I haven't missed anything and then turn it off and go about my business, you know, and trust, trust the Lord. Um, but, but the world is not getting better. Uh, you know, that goes totally against evolution. The so-called science of evolution is really a faith. It takes lots of faith to, to believe that, you know, some big bang uh, and chaos turned into wh where we are today. But, but evolution would say that things are getting better. Uh, but, but we see that that's not true. And the Bible's very clear uh, that uh, we're going to now progress in such a way that it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Lot before the Lord returns. And so we can be excited uh, as Christ followers that, hey, I trust the Lord. I trust his word. I, I view his word as absolute truth and authority from Genesis to Revelation. And, and so when I read that the Lord is going to return for his church, then I get excited about that. And that I'm reminded, okay, well then, Lord, I want to dial into you. And, and I know, Lord, I know me well enough that I can't be perfect, even though you command from your word to be holy as you are holy. I realize, wait a minute, I can't do that. You know, and uh, uh, if it's just me on my own, if I hear you need to be holy as God is holy, that's his commandment. It's very similar to Jesus saying to the group of people, Unless your righteousness doesn't exceed those of the Pharisees, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So that information all on its own without the Holy Spirit, it's like, well, I might as well close this book, and I might as well go and find another way of life, another religion, because, see, that's impossible. But, see, the fact is, and we're, we've learned that in Firm Foundation, it's the Lord going to do that work. He's doing the math equation when he commands, be holy as I'm holy, and I say, I can't do it, he says, I know that, Kirk. Let me do that in you. It's called sanctification. This continual setting apart and being made holy, it's all the work of the Lord, and all glory goes back to the Lord. It's nothing ever of what I or we can do. I can't make myself holy as much as I want to. As much as I want to do spiritual push-ups and all the check marks of, well, I went to church three times this week, and I read X amount of chapters of the Bible you know, as if I'm puffed up and, and see, uh, of course the Lord saved me. Look how good I am. You know, no way. No way near truth. See, the, it's always the fact that I go back to the cross and I realize who I was when, when, I, when I got there and I was broken. And, and it's the Lord who's doing the work. Amen? Amen? And so let's look at a few things. And by the way, uh, I found out uh, that Ryan's already announced we're going to do the book of Romans after Hosea. I'm very excited about that. And, and I'm realizing that Hosea matches with Romans so well. The first part of Romans, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's Paul the Apostle lays out this teaching that we're all sinners and we don't have any hope. There's no one good. Uh, it's all of that, you know, all those facts. Uh, uh, but then, but here's the good news. It's Jesus. He did a finished work on the cross, and now put your trust in that finished work. Invite him into your life, into your heart, you know, into who you are. And not only that, but be totally identified by Jesus. And I see that in Hosea. So where it says in verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. Notice some things of, of endearment, the word children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. Now, just like in the Garden of Eden, I don't necessarily hear an angry God and him shaking his fist. I hear, uh, we have this in writing um, as an account of God's word, of proof of God's love towards his people Israel right here. He, he's, he's bringing a charge against them, but it's, but it's a warning. It's like, hey, come back to me. Wake up, Kirk. You're going the wrong way. Come back to me. You know, man, we've got things to do, you and I together, right? That's what I'm hearing. Um, and it, then... The re from the inhabitants of the land of verse 1 and the, the word there is no truth or mercy um, 
if you had a red letter edition of the Old Testament, this is all going to be God speaking. It's all, you could say, red letter. God says, there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. So we, so we go from similitude stuff in verses 1 through 3 of, of Hosea, Gomer, his children. It's a picture of actually of Israel and God's heart of love toward a, a broken uh, wife, really. The wife of, of God is broken. And she's gone of the wrong way, but we see God's heart broken with that. It's very much like uh, the, the story of the prodigal son. The, the son takes his inheritance and he goes and he lives wild. Uh, uh, we can also connect it with uh, the account where this lady is taken in, the, in adultery and brought before <coughs> Jesus. And the, the religious people said, hey, you know, uh, we need to stone her. That's what the law says. And, and Jesus doesn't disagree but he says, uh, those of you without sin, throw the first stone. And, and it's, it's, it connects also with what Ryan said, I think, last week, the account in Luke, where this righteous, religious, uh, self-righteous, religious, legalistic man is standing up proud and praying, you know, I'm glad I'm not like other people. And then, uh, and then the real person is in the back, and he won't even lift his head, and he's be beating his breast, and he said, Lord, Forgive me. Have mercy upon me. I'm a sinner. See, that, that should be all of us. That's connecting. Therefore, no truth or mercy or knowledge of God is in the land. You know, we know that truth is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no one, there's no way to get to the Father except through him. And mercy is a very special Hebrew word. The word mercy uh, in Hebrew is kesed. And um, it's, it's one of those words that can also connect quite closely with the Greek word agape, you know, that godly love, that selfless love that we can only experience when we're in God, kesed. There's no truth or mercy. It could be translated loving kindness um, or knowledge of God in the land. See, that's the problem. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. So just like in the days of of Noah, there's violence in the land, and everyone's going their own way. And, and I've got my rights, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak like an application as we go. You know, just like today, we see the, the world's in such a mess because why? Because truth and mercy and the knowledge of God is missing because we've said, no, thank you. Worldwide, I, we can make a case that maybe every country, uh, every government has said, uh, at least in some way, some shape, some form, no thank you, God. I've got this. I'm going to go my own way. And, and what happens? Just like what we're seeing in this book here. Um, terrible things happen. Um, verse 3, therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. I see that uh, without truth, or mercy or knowledge of God it affects everything you know right now uh, a lot of what the world's talking about is man we need to treat um, the universe better you know it's like that's the name of the God the universe you know well you know I need to I need to think turn and think the universe you know like so remember we had a drought in this country not too long ago since I've lived here and we were praying for rain uh, and, and the Lord blessed, and he gave us rain. We've been seeing that, hey, we have reminders. Oh, re I remember there was a drought, and I remember, you know, a once a week, quick, quick shower with, you know, gray water and, and from buckets that you're saving from rainwater and all of that. And, and so here we are that we've, that's been passed, and if we're not careful, we forget those things. And we forget to even turn and thank God for rain. But I promise you, the way that this world is, there's many people in that situation, they would turn and thank the cloud. Thank you, cloud. You know, my wife and I, we were watching a show about uh, these people uh, up in Canada and Alaska, and it's called Alone, and they're trying to survive uh, on their own, you know, getting food, and they have to do their own shelter. And, and this one young lady, I really appreciated her, but, you know, she would, she would do those things. Thank you, cloud you know, for the rain. Thank you, squirrel, for the meal I'm about to eat, you know. Uh, uh, so 
<laughs> not going far enough. Okay, yeah, yeah, the squirrel is literally going to be my food, but who provided it? It's Jesus. You know, it's, it's God. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. Thank you. You know, uh, and so without truth or mercy or the knowledge of God, we humans, we're going to do those things. And, and uh, please be aware that's happening all around us right now. You know, it's called new age. There's nothing new about it. But, but you know, why can't everyone just get along and, uh, you know, let's, let's be tolerable of everything. And, and let's thank the rock, you know, for, uh, and we'll, we'll stack them in a certain way so it looks pretty. And now we're going to worship a rock. And uh, it's just one of God's creations. It's not the creator. That's God alone. Let's move on. Verse 4, now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. There's some, some tricky ways to translate some of this. But, but this is saying no one really has the right to judge anyone else. And, and plus, uh, yeah, we might say at the end of this verse 4 that the priest has tried to give you truth. And just like we see in the New Testament, there's going to be a time where people will gather and they will set up a teacher that uh, handles the itching ear. You know, it's going to tickle my ear. I want to find somewhere, you know, in other words, the, the world will say in the end times, that's going to make me feel good. You know, don't, don't make me feel convicted. Don't make me feel any guilt at all. You know, uh, people are good, you know. And if, you know, and uh, the God that you're talking about from the Bible is too judgmental. All these things that we're hearing. Uh, and so what, what we're doing in the world at large, those without Christ, they're making an idol in their own mind and in their own heart. They're, they're making up a God uh, in their imagination that they're comfortable with, as opposed to learning of who the real God is. And yes, the real creator God did some amazing things for us showing his love, but he's also completely just and righteous, which means that he will completely judge sin. Eventually, every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of all. And, and so that's the real God. Therefore, uh, you, you, you shall stumble in the day, in verse 5, the prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. So this is turning into now a scolding for the priests. And, and I, I take this to heart. You know, uh, in a role as a, a Bible teacher, as a pastor, uh, we know from James that I'm going to be judged more strictly. And so, so you, you, you approach the whole idea with fear and trembling in a, in a healthy fear and healthy trembling. Uh, but that's really for all of us too. My people, notice uh, it goes from children to verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I, I see God's heart here. He's still saying you're my people. That's his heart for the whole world. He, his heart for the whole world, the Lord's heart, and his love for the whole world is that all would repent and come to uh, you know, true godly repentance and salvation. That's the Lord's heart. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Notice it says you have rejected. I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I, will also, I also will forget your children. This might mean as a priest, you know, the, the flock that a priest has are looked on as their children. And, and so we're going to see that um, everyone involved is going to be liable uh, for their own sin. And that's very clear in the Bible. Uh, verse 7, the more they increased, the more they sinned against me. And another, another way of saying it, the more they prospered, the more they said, no, thank you, and they turned their back toward me. The Lord says, I will change their glory into shame. It's, it's this idea of you reap what you sow. Now, the world might call stuff like this karma. And, and I use that word occasionally, but it's, it's, it's always in a joke, and I get it. You know, I get a giggle. Uh, but this idea that we reap what we sow, that's very clear in, in the word. Things like let your yes be yes and your no be no. And uh, you're either for me or against me. You know, the, these absolute truths, that's very clear. It doesn't take really a gifted teacher for me to understand 
that your yes should be yes and your no should be no. And, and that I'm either for the Lord, I'm all in, or I'm all out. There's no gray. There's no uh, riding the fence. It's one or the other. And so, so that's what's, what I'm seeing here. Verse 8, they eat up the sin of my people. Notice the phrase, my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. It's, it's an idea of um, with Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he kept hardening his heart. Moses would go, let my people go, was the message from God. And, and Pharaoh would harden his heart, and he would say, you know, well, who is, who is the Lord? You know, uh, and Pharaoh, remember, he looked at, at himself as if he was deity, as he was God. Uh, but they set their heart on their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priest. Uh, you can say it either way. Priests like people, people like priests. So, so gatherings in general, if there's like someone that's speaking to a crowd and, and information's going into an ear and into the brain, and then if it's this type of gathering where it's the word of God, we hope it goes from the brain to the heart, uh, and then a seed that's the word is planted and roots are uh, now growing deep and now fruit is being produced lives can change but we we can understand that um, that same idea can happen in a bad way so in my country for a long time now presidents are viewed as almost like deity you know and the messiah i mean this is the previous president and i don't want to get into politics and i refuse to but i can see that you know, uh, my country is divided almost 50-50 in the way that they vote and, and about politics and, and about people. And uh, even in church life, and it's very sad because I view all of that as distractions. See, the Lord would say, no, look higher, look to me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the only Messiah. I'm your only Savior. It's not going to be anyone that can be voted in for a country. Now, we can pray for uh, people placed in positions of authority. We're told that in Romans chapter 13. But but no one like that is going to ever come close to being my Messiah. I'm sorry, but I'm dug in on that. Uh, I'm that point. Uh, I have a firm stance that there's no one uh, before or after Jesus himself that's going to be my Messiah. It's him alone. And he's the only one that deserves that glory. So I must be careful now on how I represent him, and I must be careful on uh, how am I viewing other people. You know, even even great uh, Bible teachers, present and past, you know, let's be careful. It's the Word of God that a Bible teacher is teaching. That it, It's the Word of God we see in the Psalms that's even a given a very high place even above the name of God. I believe that's Psalm 138. But... Um, <coughs> So any so-called great Bible teacher is only great in the sense that what he's teaching is great. It's the Word of God. You know, some of the, the best Bible teaching I've ever heard is, are ones that I can't remember who taught it. Yeah, I don't remember who said this, but this is what I heard and this is what I took away. And man, it was life-changing. It was that nugget that I needed right for that moment. It was a Holy Spirit <laughs> thing. And I, I went from broken and, and, and having so many questions to, wow, I was settled and my mind uh, was strengthened, and my soul was established, and I, and I went away from that teaching, like, yeah, man, I, I'm ready, Lord. Thank you for that nugget. And yet, I don't remember who taught it. That's the way it should be. You know, it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. I mean, literally, I could just, I could read chapter 4, and, and maybe say a prayer, but I could say amen, close it, and, and we could say, Wow. That was powerful. Why? Because it's God's word. And, and so Ryan and I, we have this heart that, you know, there's going to be things that's going to be hard to like, to understand. And we just want to be alongside with you to go through that journey of let's understand. Let's get deeper. Uh, and as we do that, the Lord reveals himself. And now I'm stronger. But the bigger picture is, um, so I'm one of those weirdos. <laughs> that I believe the Bible in such a way, and I, and I read it, and I understand it literally, <coughs> so I'm forced to not take it literal, 
that I believe that there's a future 1,000 year period that's going to be on this earth where Christ is going to be here. We will have returned with the Lord as his bride, and we're going to have duties of responsibility. That's in our future. And so because of that, I truly believe that the stuff that we go through now and the opportunities to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, that's all preparation for that future time. Uh, so none of this is a waste. And so because I believe that, that I live my life in a certain way that, oh man, you know, I've got to be careful. If I have a sense of calling of the Lord in my life, I, I need to be obedient to that. Obedient to the faith. I need to be so invested and have such strong trust in the Lord that, okay, Lord, I don't understand why you call me to do this or what I'm supposed to do necessarily, but I trust you and I know that you're going to work it out in my life so that it's pleasing to you. Uh, and all of that is like, okay, grade one, and then you graduate to grade two and so forth, forth and so on, uh, all leading up to all future things, important things. This is not a waste of time. And, and I can tell you that we need to be serious about that. Now, we can laugh and joke along the way. You know, that's just my personality. I'm, I'm weird that way. But, but I can tell you that I believe the word in such a way that all of this means something. So when the Lord uh, commands me to forgive people, he's serious about that. And that's preparation for now and for the future. Uh, and as we walk in obedience, man, uh, you know, almost like whistling in the dark, there's a Christian song that says that. Lord, you know, I was in uh, such darkness, but your light comes in, and now it's like I'm whistling with you as we walk from darkness into your light. And we can do that. There's this idea, Lord, I trust you to the point where, wow, I see things falling apart in World War III and bombs going off and uh, booby traps and distractions and all that. But you know what? I trust you, Lord, and this is all worthwhile. But we need to keep moving here. <clears throat> so they eat up my, the sin of my people in verse 8. Verse 9, and it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. That's, that's a really important part, point right there. And Romans 1.5, if you want to hold your spot where you are and turn quickly to Romans. I've already mentioned that Hosea matches really nicely for where we're going to be in Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Paul the Apostle, through the Spirit, says, Through him, that's Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So, so back in Hosea verse 10, it says, Because they have ceased obeying the Lord, See, we need to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit so that we continue to walk. So our path also equals, I'm, I'm walking in obedience. Uh, I'm trusting the Lord in such a high level that also means I'm obeying the Lord. Jesus, I trust you, translates perfectly, Jesus, I obey you, back in Hosea. The second half, of, starting with verse 11, might be called the spiritual idolatry of Israel. And let's go through that. Harlotry wine and new wine enslave the heart that word enslave can be translated it takes away the heart so harlotry in this sense it's worshiping idols anything that you're making up in your mind that doesn't match the word of god will be an idol even covetousness is an idol we see from paul's writing but it enslaves the heart or it takes away the heart verse 12 once again the Lord says, my people ask counsel from their wooden idols. So where are they going? They're going to self-made idols, wooden idols, and their staff informs them. This isn't like the church staff of, you know, a group of people. It's a wooden stick, their staff, the ones that they, they're walking around with. They're going to their staff and say, what should I do today? You know, maybe they throw it and, okay, which direction should I go? And it points east. Okay, I'll go east today. And, and they're in the land of Nod. Remember, after the first uh, murder, Cain was in, in the land of Nod. It means wandering. They're just wandering about. 
And a lot of the world today, the people are just wandering. They're in the land of Nod, and they're asking of their wooden idols and their staff, you know, for answers. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills. That happens around here, by the way. You know, I go for a hike and I'll see a little stack of rocks on the beach, maybe up on the, the mountains. It's like, hmm, I wonder what's happening here. <coughs> under oaks and poplars and terebinths, you know, under the, the shade of trees because their shade is good. Uh, so so they're, they're taking God's creation of a tree that was planted by the Lord, given by the Lord, and they're going there and they're sacrificing and worshiping a false god. Wow. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. Verse 14, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Now, this, uh, this could be a difficult uh, translation. Some Bible teachers would say that um, so the women involved in the har harlotry and adultery, they're not going to be punished, but the men are the ones causing that. That's one view. But I see the whole counsel of God saying that we're all responsible for our own sin. So we need, we need to take in the whole counsel of God. Um, but just like Adam and Eve, so Eve bit into the forbidden fruit, whatever that looked like, but it was Adam we see in the New Testament that gets the blame or the credit. Why? Because he was there and he was made to be the spiritual leader and he didn't say, no, no, no. Eve, don't bite. He just let it happen. He watched it happen. He was alongside. And so, so that can connect with what, what I just read. Um, either way. But it says, therefore, the, the people who do not understand will be trampled. And so we see that destruction always follows the lack of the knowledge of God. That's why we need to be in the Word even every day as our bread of life. Verse 15, though you, Israel, play the harlot, do not let Judah offend... That's another tricky one. Remember, you have Israel or Ephraim is sometimes called the northern ten tribes. And then the southern one is Judah. Uh, so now we see God's love reaching even down into this passage, warning Judah. Be careful, Judah. Don't be part of this. But we're going to see, uh, we saw through history and the word of God, that Judah will follow and be taken captive into Babylon later on. Do not come up to Gilgal. Remember when the 12 tribes <coughs> separated, then the king of the northern tribe, they set up their own little worship centers, Gilgal and Bethel. Now look at this play on words. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Beth Avon, nor swear an oath saying, as the Lord lives. Okay, so a couple of things. So Gilgal and then Beth Avon. Many Bible scholars say that this is a play on words. So the original place, uh, that was used here to worship the true God was Bethel, the house of God. Uh, you might say in Hebrew, Bethel. They, they pronounce the T-H as a T. Bethel, the house of God. Uh, but they've turned it into beth Aven, a place of pagan worship. beth Aven means just that. Their idolatry has changed even the name of what was important in their history, in their past. And, and so... Uh, we must be careful. See, that can happen to us too. It's always going to be, Lord Jesus, you're the center. You're my Savior. You're my Messiah. You're my hope. You're my future. And it says here, to finish the verse, nor swear an oath saying, as the Lord lives. See, they're going to these pagan places that they're worshiping false idols, but they're still speaking kind of uh, what we might say today, Christianese. You know, they're, they're, they're saying things that sound good. You know, yeah, I believe in God, but I also believe that, you know, I think I'm thankful for this stack of rocks that I made, too. So that I'm mixing and matching different things. And God says he will not share his glory with anyone. But we have to be reminded of that. So uh, verse 16, for Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Let's pause there. It's interesting. Back in these times, they started these pagan worship centers in Gilgal and in the in the land of Dan that's way up north and I've been to Israel and I've seen they've dug up this pagan worship center in Dan where they had a, uh, a molded image of a calf 
Remember, just like when Moses came down from the mountain and there's Aaron and the people and they've made a golden calf. Um, and so where it says like a stubborn calf, it, it's almost like um, this connection. You know, people, when they, when they go a pagan way, they're going to uh, make something to worship. And in this case, probably a, another calf. And that's what they did in, in Gilgal and they did that in Dan. Um, it says in verse 16 to follow, now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in open country. In other words, the Lord's going to remove his hand of protection. See, it's a picture that the Lord is the great shepherd and that we are completely now uh, in protection because of his eyes upon his people. But he's going to remove his hand like a lamb in open country. Ephraim, also known as Israel, is joined to idols. Let them alone. Their drink is rebellion to commit a harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Just to finish up, the word wind there in verse 19 be, can be connected with the word captivity. Because Assyria will come down like a great wind, a wind storm, and will uh, take them captive. And Assyria, the way they did it, they would take people captive, but they would also uh, put other slaves of other countries sometimes into that place where they've just taken captive the people away. And so that's, that's actually going to happen. So Samaria, also known as the Northern Ten Tribes later on, will be the Samaritans. And that's exactly what, how this happens. Uh, the Assyrians, they take away the Ten Tribes. They replace them with people of all over the world. And then they mix and match religions and whatever. And then you have what it is. And so, so that, that's chapter four. It kind of ends with almost like it should continue. And it will next week. <laughs> so from from the God, from the house of God to the house of of evil is is what you might say about this passage. And so in connection, you know, uh, I'm so thankful that we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, we cannot be any different from Israel except for who Jesus is and what He's done and doing. Amen. He's always willing to do more and more as we surrender to him in obedience. And so let's stand. I'll close in prayer. Then we'll have a time of fellowship with tea and coffee and one last song. Anyway, it's nice to be home. Uh, Karen and I are just so grateful for your, your love and your, your, your prayers. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word again today. And I thank you for your love and how you prove yourself continually. And we thank you, Lord, that we can always come before you, and you're the one that would draw us near to you. As we take a step of faith, you're already there with arms wide open. And I pray for those maybe who might be struggling, Lord, even in a relationship with you. And I pray today that they would just surrender to your love, and that they would see that your heart is for them, and that you're always there, and that you never change. And so thank you, Lord, that yes, uh, we are born broken, and yet, in your love, you reach down and you bring healing. And uh, you breathe new breath into us. And so we ask that today, by your spirit, you would breathe into us afresh. That you would fill us with your spirit to overflowing. That we would walk in as a powerful witness to the glory of your grace. Uh, as we're passing through this world, waiting for a new city with a true foundation that's built on you, Lord Jesus. So we say yes and amen to you, and we thank you that you've given us this time, and we give you all the glory. Lord, we adore you, and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. amen.